Why so negative? A Dvar Torah for Parashat Kedoshim. I like to think of myself as a logical person. Well, not exactly logical, but as one who likes patterns. For example, there's a game I like to play with myself and my kids. Uh, those are willing to put up with my insanities. We, uh, that is I, look for and arrange mathematical patterns in numbers on license plates of cars we pass. Something about putting the numbers and making them play and do what I'm supposed... Whatever. The problem I have with this week's parasha, Parashat Kedushim, is that it seems that there's a jumble of laws. It leaves the reasonable reader, meaning me, in a lot of confusion. The recurring root Kadesh makes it clear that we're looking for some kind of sanctitometer. And the widespread use of the phrase, I am Hashem your God, or the abbreviated version, I am Hashem, presents a divine threshold that we're expected to meet. But what is that threshold? I, I still need someone to help me find my bearing. Thankfully, that's what Ibn Ezra tries doing. Systematically, he goes over all the mitzvot that appear in the parasha and explains the smichut parashiyot, the association between subject and subject. It links all verses of the parasha. Problem is, well, here's a random collection. Orla appears here because after mentioning the fruit of the field and the fruit of the man, it's natural to speak about the fruit of the tree. We continue with the mitzvah of the fourth year, which is netarevai, the first year that one can actually eat their fruit. Only you have to eat it bimakom kadosh. And then one can eat the fruit on the fifth year. Since we've already addressed the fact that the fruit of the tree cannot be eaten immediately after their growth, this is a good time to add that meat isn't eaten before the blood is thrown on the altar if the animal is slaughtered near the mishkan. And this comes to counter the fact that in Egypt, this wasn't common practice. And of course, as soon as we mention things that the Egyptians did, it's worth remembering that they also shaved their head and beard, tattooed their bodies, and scratched their flesh. And he who scratches himself is interested in emphasizing this fact. So it's a good time to mention that it's forbidden to present one's daughter's body to the eyes of all. And what's forbidden to the individual is also forbidden throughout the land. And of course, scratching has was customary when someone died and priest mourned and old men and I don't know. If you manage to follow Ibn Ezra's route without it confusing you more than you already were, then you're a better person than I am. What I understood from this was that the search for order in the verses is right and proper, but his suggestions did not create the desired pattern. Midrash Rabbah claims that the parasha rearranged the Ten Commandments in different order several times. We can see more obvious hints for this, such as Shabbat and adultery or less, do not kill al Hadam. But I could not link Netarevai to one of the commandments, so this pattern didn't really help me either. Radatz Hoffman takes a slightly broader point of view. In his opinion, the purpose of the first half of the set of laws is to strengthen the honor and recognition of God, as opposed to the second half which distances man from the behavior of the goyim and pagan conceptions. His challenge is to explain the presence of the Shabbat, because the Gentiles do not keep it, and honoring one's elders, because Gentiles don't respect him, but it is easier to stay within the lines when the boundaries are so much wider. Which made me think that perhaps an even broader picture is needed to come up with a common denominator. As I expanded my research to include the entire parasha, I discovered that kedusha is mostly related to what is not. The word lo is repeated 42 times, almost double the times that Shem Hashem appears in, which is the next word to come. This is before adding words with similar intent, such as al and shamo. That is, the way to sanctity is to stay away from forbidden things. And as Sefer puts it, Purushim to you. This also touched a different difficulty I had with the Psukim. The Torah commands to leave part of the crops for the poor, seemingly an example of an altruistic and wonderful exemplary society, which takes care of both the weak and the poor. My problem is that if this is what the Torah was trying to paint, a wonderful world where everyone takes care of their friends, a utopian social holiness, I would phrase the verses like this, leave food in the field for those who do not have. I am Hashem your God. In other words, I would emphasize what to do. 
This is not what the Torah does. Instead, it forbids us from harvesting and gathering. Or, as the Gemara in Masechet Yevamot says, the Torah informs us about the sin of Leket Shechecha Opea. Or, as we said, in order to reach Kedusha, one must beware. Stop doing certain other things. And to make sure I don't leave on such a negative note, let me add that Sefer Vaikra doesn't end with Parashat Kedushim. From the second half of Parashat Emor, we begin to see the more active and positive sides of what is expected of us, but that's for another time. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and pass it on to a friend. I am Dovi Holtz, one who loves Tanakh.